Hello, my friends. Can you hear me? I think we are live. And welcome to the Saturday morning live stream here at Garden Like a Viking. So, uh, yes, today I hope that everything is going to work out good with the, uh, with the, right now we have like a windstorm happening. And so, for whatever reason, the internet sometimes cuts out during a windstorm. I don't know why that would really be because it's not like it's, uh, <laughs> maybe the signal's getting blown away by, by, uh, the wind or something, I guess, but I, I don't think that's how it works. So I'm not sure why it cuts out when there's a windstorm, but we'll see. Maybe the, uh, gardening gods are with us today, which of course they are. Um, and so good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, let us see, what was I going to say? Oh yes, and this house. So you might hear a lot of this, um, uh, there might be some background noise because this house is a hundred years old. Good morning, Val. This house is a hundred years old and it sounds, in a windstorm, it sounds like an old, old wooden ship. It sounds like there's, it's got original windows, original doors that are a hundred years old. And so uh, everything is like, it just feels like an old ship at sea. Stuff's clanking around, and uh, yeah. So, good morning, Trish. Good to see you again. Good morning, Val. Good morning, Ahmed. Been waiting for this. Yes, me too, my friends. So, uh, let's see. What do we got to talk about? All kinds of stuff today, actually, because we have pretty much started the indoor gardening time here because it is the uh, beginning of November here in Zone 5B, 6A, Northern Indiana. And it is the gardening season, the, the uh, fall garden is still coming into full swing. We still have cabbages out there. I have a couple of New Brunswick cabbages. If you guys like big, uh, like German style cabbages, the New Brunswick is a very good one. It's very cold hardy. And uh, we've already had a number of frosts, yet this stuff is just laughing at the frost. And they are like this big, okay? And my head is huge, so they're like this big. Now, um, they will store very well. They also make very good sauerkraut. They also make good like cabbage and potatoes and stuff. But if you take your cabbages, listen, so if you have the big cabbages, like the New Brunswick ones, then you can, uh, w once it starts to get really cold, good morning, Ryan, yes, from mid-Michigan. So you'll relate to this. Once it starts to get really cold, uh, like below 20, then even the New Brunswick cabbages are gonna go by the wayside. Good morning, Jerry. Uh, and so once the temperatures are going to drop below like 20 degrees of Fahrenheit, we're going to um, pull up the cabbage with a little bit of the roots, okay? We don't normally do that, but for storage, we can do that. We pull it up by the roots and uh, brush off the roots, you know, the soil from the roots, and we're going to hang it upside down and wrap it in newspaper, okay? Wrap it in a number of sheets of newspaper, uh, or we can uh, take a, pla a um, paper bag, like a brown paper sack, and we can cut a hole in it and put the roots through it and then let the whole inside, uh, you know, stay within there. And then we're going to hang it upside down in a root cellar-like condition. Now, they will last for a couple of months like that, okay? If it stays cool enough, uh, you can keep them like that for a number of months and they'll stay fresh. Or you can put them in the crisper of your refrigerator and they'll stay good for months, way into the winter time. Especially a variety like New Brunswick, okay? Good morning, Garth. Garth says, hey guys, good morning from Northern Ontario. Multitasking this morning, making sauerkraut and watching the Viking. That sounds like a good Saturday, my friend. Uh, yeah, sauerkraut, what's your recipe? Do you use the traditional, the juniper berries and the caraway? Uh, or what way do you like to make it? Good morning, Mad Dog. Good morning from Chicago. Uh, Ingrid's Kitchen, good morning. Good to see you again. Uh, and Jason Knight, good day, Nate and everyone. Home needs and local idea. Hey, bro, what's up, my friend? Ruben Cervantes says, good morning. There is a lot of grubs in my garden. How do I get them under control? I get that question a lot and I don't have enough experience to be able to say with confidence what is the best, me best method to get the grubs under control. Uh, I imagine the Jadam sulfur would, but you wouldn't want to just saturate your entire garden with the sulfur. If any of you guys have any uh, tips on grub control, please say them now, okay? 
because uh, or put them in the comments if you're going to watch this afterwards go ahead and put them uh, in the comments and um, that way we can all learn from it okay because you know we've been talking a lot about the moles what to do with moles and stuff and uh, uh, um, somebody wrote me a really convincing comment that sounded like they had experience and he said look all you have to do is take fruity flavored bubblegum and drop it into their holes he said yes I feel bad for the little creatures because obviously you know they eat it and it uh, you know kills them in some way but uh, if you have a mole infestation which a lot of you do uh, apparently that works really well so you can give that a try and remember from you guys uh, from like a dozen comments now everyone has said that you can utilize the borax for the ants okay um, so let's see Larry good hi from Texas good morning Larry Pamela good morning hello from Louisiana House Boat Grandma says, I use my grubs and worms for fishing on the bayou, South Louisiana here. Love my worms. Very nice, yes. Well, in that case, you wouldn't want to do anything to them. And the grubs, I haven't really found to be an issue. Grubs are an issue with like lawns and stuff in particular, I think. The main thing that the grubs do is they attract the moles and the voles. And so that is the main drawback from having uh, grubs in the yard. What they actually do themselves is, I don't really th feel like it's a lot of damage. You know, so um, yeah, uh, that's the thing with, with preventative measures or curative measures. You always have to weigh, okay, how much damage is the thing actually doing? Or do I just have it in my mind that I need to get rid of it? But how much is it actually doing? I feel this way a lot with ants. Now, some people have major issues with ants. They have major problems and they're eating the flesh of the of the things or they make uh, nests in the root zone of things okay in that case you would need to treat them but for most people if they'll just see an anthill in the garden and think I have to get rid of it but you don't have to get rid of it and you don't have to get rid of every caterpillar you don't have to get rid of definitely don't get rid of spiders in the garden indoors is a different thing <laughs> but outdoors you want them uh, so we always have to, to weigh the pros and cons of, okay, how much of an issue is this really? And am I going to harm the uh, ecosystem and ultimately the uh, pest predator balance? Am I going to harm that more by this preventative measure? Uh, so you have to take all that into consideration and then, you know, use the least harmful of the methods. Uh, grubs are the larval form of Japanese beetles. They eat grass roots in that stage. Correct. Yes, I did understand that. Grubs... But, is our, but not all grubs are Japanese beetle larvae. I think that Japanese beetle larvae exist in the form of a grub. Grub. But yeah, the Japanese beetles, some years they're real bad, some years not so much. Uh, but I have found that those traps, the attractant traps, just attract more. They just attract more. I mean, if you, if they're swarming around those things on a nice sunny day, those traps for the Japanese beetles, and so I always think, I'm thinking, man, if you put it and uh, you're attracting, you're calling all the Japanese beetles from all the area around that maybe otherwise might not be there. So uh, let's see. Sharon, good morning from the Pacific Northwest. A lovely place. Uh, what's that smoke next to you? It is steam, my friend, from the tea. It is steam from the tea. It does kind of look like smoke, doesn't it? It is, uh, although I could be burning uh, frankincense tears, I love to burn that, so I'll take a chunk of charcoal and I'll burn just the actual resin, the tears of the frankincense uh, tree, the Botswana tree, actually. Uh, grandma says, or houseboat grandma says, ants, huge problem here, South Louisiana. I take two different piles of ants, mix them, and stir them up. They will fight each other to the death. You have to stir the pile to make them fight. That is a that is such a fitting analogy for uh, current human situation as well. Perhaps uh, you have to stir the pile to make them fight; otherwise, they won't fight normally. Uh, so there is the so that's why Houseboat Grandma in Louisiana says that uh, you need to stir the pile of ants, put them together, and they'll fight to the death. That's really um, th that makes sense, though. I mean, as far as ants would go. Um, 
So someone asked, what is the tea? Now, most of the time I am, you know, I'm brewing like sage or cinnamon and cloves and ginger and, and sometimes garlic even. Yeah, if I, if I feel something coming on, even though I don't, you know, hardly ever feel that. But uh, this today, because I was trying to gather some supplies, I lost track of time. This is just cheating. This is the yogi tea called uh, Breathe. It's for, um, you know, because I do a lot of breathing exercises and stuff. So I like the breathe um, things. It's basically mints and stuff like that. But yes, let's see what the thing says. Our creative consciousness is not limited. Yes, we understand this very well. So it's the Breathe by Yogi. Uh, hold on. It is scolding hot, obviously. Okay, Mike D says, what's up, Nate? Been having problems gathering leaf mold during drought months in southern Oregon. Would worm castings be a good replacement for JMS and other such inoculant inoculations? Uh, not really. You know, I get that question a lot, and the worm castings are wonderful, and they are a very good thing to include in your system, and you can make teas with them. And next year, I'll show how to make a number of different, like, aerated compost teas, just for the, some people like that, you know. I, I still recommend, I mean, there's no need to do anything different than the JDOM methods that, I, that you've seen so far on this channel. But in certain situations, people like different things or they can't find certain things like that. So uh, we just always need options. And just like good health, you know, for the body uh, is the key to good health is to get the widest diversity of high quality ingredients, both plant and animal, potentially, if that's what you're into, into the body. Okay. So, uh, the plants and the soil are the same. The widest diversity of uh, nutrition sources is key. So, yes, the, um, the worm castings would work, but they're not the same as the leaf mold, right? Uh, they are uh, very, very different, okay? So, try to find the leaf mold if you can, because in Southern Oregon, you should be able to find that, man, for sure, right? Because I lived in Northern California, and it was, uh, there was, it was everywhere. It was beautiful, ancient forest. You know, try to go, it doesn't matter if it's a redwood forest or the old conifer forest, that's all good stuff. So try to go to some of them and just, you only need a few handfuls, you know, for it's the microbial activity. Um, as a last resort, if you can't find it, then yeah, the worm castings can work. Um, uh, Ruben said milky spore, right? Yes, that's right. I forgot all about that. Yes, I have heard this from multiple people that the milky spore is a certain type of bacteria that you can, or fungi, that you can get that will, um, you spray it onto the area and it will infect, it's like a parasitic thing, it will infect the grub and it will kill them. That's all that it does. It doesn't do anything additional harming of the land. So uh, we'll see, you know, we'll see. Um, so I hope that answered your question, Mike, but uh, the worm castings, yeah, they can be used, but they're no replacement for the good quality leaf mold. Uh, and let's see here. And um, Bobby says, man, I sure am looking forward to the next saga of Nate Murray. <laughs> Thank you very much, my friend. And I appreciate all your comments on that channel. I've just seen them and uh, I, I appreciate the engagement and stuff like that. The saga of Nate Murray channel. Yeah, that, that is like uh, that's a whole different experience for me. You know, it's more like an art form. It's more like my form of expression in, in the sense that, you know, so many things I, I went through and stuff and to try to put them into story form. And then uh, to show people, or, or just to, it's more therapeutic for myself. If I'm totally honest, those were all made for myself, those kind of videos. It's therapeutic, processing things that have happened to you that you just, hmm. Otherwise, it's a very unique, um, it's a very unique source of expression. So, yes, I will uh, probably make some more of those videos before too long. Patricia says, me too, really enjoyed the saga. Thank you, my friends. So we are only one year into a 10 year odyssey and it gets way crazier and there's actually way more uh, footage because when I first started traveling, man, I was carrying half, I was carrying 500 megabyte uh, memory cards. And then I would have to go to an internet cafe and download the pictures onto a, a CD and then mail the CD back to my parents. That's how I was, that's how we had to do it at the very beginning. And that was like cutting edge technology. Now people are walking around with ter five terabyte, you know, little hard drives like this, and they can just film 24 hours a day, and so it's totally different now. So that's why the saga of Nate Murray was all about, I'm having to storytell a lot of it, because we don't have 
every waking second on uh, footage like people do nowadays, you know, so uh, that's, that's part of it. Now, when I go traveling next time, you know, then it will, it'll just be a whole different experience. Yeah. But I'll never travel like that again. I mean, I travel open-endedly with no plan. I, I bought a one-way ticket to Sri Lanka. I sold everything I had and I was just like, all right, peace. I mean, I'm out for good with no intention of returning, with no return ticket, with no onward ticket. I'm just going to Sri Lanka and we'll see. Uh, you know, I had saved up. I ended up having like 15 grand because I worked at the factory for two years and I saved up every dime I could. So I had 15 grand and that's, man, it was crazy. So anyways, uh, let's see. Mark says, uh, have you... Have you ever experimented with juicing for you and your plants? I love celery, spinach, carrots, and add banana through flowering periods. I have not gave juice to the plants in particular, not actual juice from a juice extractor. I would consume that myself, but through a fermenter, you know, through fermentation processes like the fertilizers and stuff, yes, we feed them back in that way because even the juice would not be um, uh, accessible to the plants. You know, it would have to, of course, be um, processed through the soil food web. So let us see. Mike D, $5. Thank you, my friend. Little uh, hippo saying hype. Let's see. Linnea says, hi, Nate. I just heard about Super Labs. It's spirulina mixed into rice wash to ferment together. I've never heard of that. And I wonder why. Why would we need? What would be the benefit? You know, I, I would have to think of that, um, but there's some things, you know, it's difficult to improve on, well, it's impossible to improve on perfection. So there's the labs, but then maybe super labs is something completely separate. We'll see. So experiment with it and let me know, or send me a link to gather more knowledge about that and I'll begin experimenting with it. Uh, Cause that's what I like to do. As soon as I find out about something, boom, I'll start implementing it and I'll experiment it you know, experiment with it. That's why the garden is, and stuff is not, it's uh, a lot of people, once they find a way that works, that's it. They're good. They just, they do it and they do it for years and years and years. Well, this is how my grandma did it. She taught me and it works, you know, and that's, that's cool. I mean, that, that's how, I mean, that's how success happens. That's how people have successful growing periods for themselves. But me, I'm like, okay, I found something that works. Okay, I can check that off the box. It works. And I'll keep using that probably, but then immediately on to other experimentations so I can acquire new knowledge and find new ways and uh, test the old ways continuously, you know, just to make sure. They have to have rigorous testing. And uh, you, ha you have to have lots of, well, just the more experience, the better. You know what I'm saying? Okay, 62 on the chat and only five likes. Come on, guys, hit that thumbs up. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, guys, hit the thumbs up, please. Um, when will you, when will you make that video of why you were expelled of school? How did you know? When did I say that? Uh, yeah, man. I think maybe last. Or, yeah, I might have said it on here. Yeah, sometime I will. It, it, it'll be on the the saga of Nate Murray channel though, the other one, um, because. Yeah, so remember guys, I had perfect attendance in high school for 11 and a half years. Every day I went to school. I mean, it was like my focus. I was obsessed, you know, of course. And so uh, I never missed a day of school my entire life until halfway through my senior year when I got expelled forever and arrested <laughs> and put in jail. Yeah, it's crazy, I know. But yeah, totally derailed the current, the course that I was on, as far as I was going to the military, I was trying to go to uh, either West Point or the Naval Academy. And, and I, I was in the honors classes and all of this stuff. And I was very, very focused. And I was in all the hardest honors classes that you could get. And extra career, I was captain of the wrestling team, you know, junior and senior year, all of this stuff. And I was like in the bodybuilding contest, I was the benchathon champion and stuff, all this stuff. And then boom, got derailed 100% and got arrested, never allowed back in school. All the, the West Point, all the, the Naval Academy gone, no chance of any of that kind of stuff. All that stuff, just like the rug wiped out from under you, boom. And then all of a sudden, all the people that respected me and everything, and I was like captain of the wrestling team and stuff, boom, gone. All that stuff was gone in, an, in one day. And so and then I was put in the criminal school uh, called LC Ward here. It, it's, called, it's called Ward is the name of the school. It's for the criminals that got expelled. And so I was put in there 
with all the kids that nobody ever expected anything of. You just put all the criminals in one area, and that sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? So that they can all uh, get to know each other better, because that's who they're, they're you know, it's just a self-perpetuating cycle, things like that, when you do that to young kids. But fortunately, uh, everything turned out really well for me, because I would have never started working at the factory, and then I would have never got fed up enough that I left and went traveling for 10 years and had, had the life that I have. So it's actually turned out what was my greatest unbelievable curse at the time turned out to be my life's greatest blessing. So houseboat, I just learned that you can eat the leaves from sweet potatoes and they are far better than spinach and free. I love free food. Not me too. Getting ready to plant garlic from garlic I planted last year from huge crop. Yes, the uh, sweet potato leaves are very good they are a good they're they're better than spinach in the sense that they don't bolt and they love the heat so if you're in the south like that it will grow really well even for us up here in indiana northern indiana uh spinach bolts and so it needs like the pacific northwest is what spinach likes that temperate sort of um you know mild cool sort of moist and stuff and i'm talking like fall through spring in the pacific northwest um and and I got a question from one of you guys about um, it was do you think do you think that I could take the sweet potato vine that I have growing now cut a piece off of it and root it and then grow it over the winter and then plant it as a slip in the springtime now in theory yes that will work you you could root the cutting and then uh, as it gets too long just cut another piece off and root that again a couple of times over the winter and then plant it in the springtime but you would never want to do it that way because you're losing vigor the whole time and you're just gonna to have to nurse it along because the sweet potato wants to grow fast with a intense sun and intense heat it doesn't want to just just be nursed along all winter long being all sickly in the dry air you know and stuff like that it doesn't like that so what's better is to forget about that unless you just want to grow it for an ornamental little vine in the house but what's better is to forget about that and then in the early springtime i will show you guys uh, the method to use just one of the sweet potatoes that we have harvested um, as to grow new slips and the new slips uh, are going to be way more vigorous the the shoots are going to be thicker and more full of life force and they're going to have better rooting capabilities and it's just the natural way and so let us uh, not try to nurse them along all winter and instead let us just make the new ones in the springtime and i showed you guys a way last year to make the um the uh with the water method now that method works good and i've been using that for a few years now but last year i got introduced to the method of using the soil and i utilized that because remember i said i'm all about experimentation so i immediately put that to the test and it i'm just gonna be honest the soil method blows the water method out of the water <laughs> yeah no pun intended it totally blows it out of the water guys so we will only be doing the soil method from now on uh as far and the the it's just pretty awesome. So I'll show you guys. And it's actually much faster than the water method. The, putting the sweet potato in the water takes like two or three months, you know, but in the soil, it's much faster. So, okay. Uh, and okay, Val, hi. First time I've made it to the live. Is it okay to use a mixture of manures in one bucket? Chicken, goat, pig, sheep, horse? Yes, if that's what you would like to do, definitely. If you have that much manure though, you should uh, spread it onto the field or the crops right now, definitely. Uh, the only one from that that I would omit is the pig. The, the manure of the swine is not ideal just because, um, well, for many reasons, kind of gross, but I won't get into them. But uh, depending, if it's like your own natural hog, you know, that you're just feeding all your scraps and stuff like that, then it, it would, then yes. Um, can utilize that but if it's from like a farm definitely steer clear of it like a farm that raises pigs definitely steer clear of that mess okay um busy girl says same results for the sweet potato soil was faster yeah much faster uh so i use composted horse poop leaf compost too and yes that all works very good and i'm going to be showing you guys a um new well not really new it's actually ancient but a way to compost all the leaves and to get some really good leaf mold over the winter time so uh, i'll show you a number of different options 
The main reason that I haven't uh, made the leaf video yet, like how to make your own really good leaf mold and stuff for next year, is because it's been the kind of fall where uh, the, the trees hold on to the leaves for a long time. So just recently, pretty much like today with this windstorm and this rain, they will start falling to the ground. So now we'll have bags of leaves that we can go around and gather but up in, that's why it's been so long. Plus everything is still humming right along in the garden. So once we have to, we'll get to a certain point and then we will just make the call and everything goes to sleep in the garden over the winter. And so any of the foliage that's left, we're gonna take it and we're gonna do the composting method with it, with the leaves and with some horse manure or chicken manure if you can get it. If not, it's acceptable. Otherwise, I'll show you multiple different techniques, but um, yes. Okay, I was thinking that. Glad I asked. It's from my nephew's farm that only has a couple pigs, but he mixes all manures into one pile. I would say that would be fine. That would be fine to use. You know, uh, it's it, the main thing is like they have to give animals and stuff serious antibiotics, and the feed has got antibiotics in it and various forms of antibiotics, and all of that um, creates well, multiple different things. Antibiotic resistance within strains of bacteria, but also it goes through them and it creates antibiotic conditions in the manure. And so it's very bad for the microbe, the life in the soil, okay? Um, let me see here, somebody, yeah, Eric Trainer, $10. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for doing the Q and A's, Nate. You are very welcome, my friend. And we will continue doing these all winter long. I mean, that's, um, you know, that's the plan. Uh, even though the, the gardening stuff has sort of gone to sleep, uh, it doesn't matter because we got the indoor stuff that is just really getting started. And so, uh, yeah, I know not as many people are interested in that, but for those, the inner core right here, the faithful uh, ones, the true believers, and the ones that have the need to grow, like I do, then uh, you're going to be wanting to grow stuff all winter long, okay? Um, and so, yeah, that's what it's about. Chad asked a question, okay, Deanna says, Chad asked a question about parasites and rabbit manure. Do they go away with age or should we not use it? Parasites and rabbit manure. I don't have enough experience with the parasites and the rabbit manure to know for sure, but I would say use it anyways. Put wh whatever parasites might be in there are going to be taken care of through the process. Now, I wouldn't I don't know exactly. Who raises rabbits that has um, that has um, experience with parasitic um, problems with the rabbits? So I would compost it in the method of the JLF uh, with the leaf mold and just let it all compost and everything will balance out. That's, that's the thing. Most of the time, we just have to let nature balance everything out. Uh, and it's very unlikely anyways that those parasites are going to pass on to anything in the plant there usually would be specific to the host, which would be a rabbit. So if you have like a bunch of rabbits, maybe don't spread it around. But if it's just on your garden, I don't think that would matter at all. Val says, should I continue using JMS in the garden? My cold hardy plants are struggling. Last applied the mixture a week ago. I covered with frost cloth during a hard freeze and they came through, amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can, although, you know, um, it's, it's coming to a close, you know, the, the activity in the soil and stuff. So what would be better spent, the time better spent, I forget exactly where you're at, Val, uh, but the time better spent would be uh, getting manures in line and getting leaves gathered up so that as soon as the, the plants are done, which would be pretty soon, uh, then we're going to wipe all of them out and then we are going to add fertility into the soil. And this is going to be very important. So your time would be better spent in uh, getting ready for that. And then we will add a few uh, applications of the JMS, yes. So, I mean, short answer, yes, of course, just keep adding the JMS, okay. Um, Northern Arizona in the mountains, 7B. Okay, so it gets relatively cold. Um, let's see here, what kind of, let's see. Hello, shooting the soil, hello, uh, Ahmed. Do you think tomato leaf miners need to be controlled? And if so, what should we use to them and how to apply? Uh, tomato leaf miners, they need to be controlled if they are doing damage that is hindering the plant. So you're going to have to be the gauge of that. But you can look, I have never had issues with tomato leaf miners. And so, but if I did, if I saw the, the uh, leaf miners, then uh, I would 
begin by applying the simple pesticide, the simple natural pesticide of the uh, garlic and the pepper and the, um, J the Jadam wetting agent or the Castile soap. You know, I would use that in combination. Possibly, uh, I would use that probably three nights in a row. And then I would see if that, you know, worked. And then if I needed something more, I would um, add the Jadon Sulfur, probably. I, I would try an application or two of that. And then if there was still issues, then I would try the, um, I would make the pesticide out of the Jerusalem artichoke or the Korean pask flower. I haven't showed you guys how to make those ones yet, but... Those are the actual ones that the JDOM method recommends that have been tested the most. So Jerusalem artichokes, that is what uh, we would just make the JDOM um, herbal solution out of that. So we boil the Jerusalem artichokes for a long time. I actually made a real big batch just this fall. And then I canned it in half gallon uh, containers. And that is going to last until the springtime. I mean, those last, you know, it's canned, so it's good for indefinitely. So that is um, what I would do. And I, I would try all three of those things. So there's no, when you're farming, like in this method, there's no one answer. Oh, we'll add this and that'll take care of it because it just doesn't work like that. So you have to see and you have to say first, okay, is it a big enough problem that warrants uh, a measure that I should take a measure? And then if the answer is yes, then we will go, okay, let's start with the least impactful to everything uh, of the solutions all right and that would be like the oregano and mint okay that je that herbal solution would be the first one to try and then the garlic and and ginger or the garlic and uh, um, pepper one also ginger would work well or also onions you know boil the onions and and extract that spray that on and then if that doesn't work then you know you try higher ones okay so Anyways, De People says, I'm watching from Africa. Thanks for your insightful analysis. I have always planted determinate tomatoes. Seed companies around here don't sell indeterminate tomato varieties. Really? I wonder why that is. Yeah, the indeterminate ones, they just keep growing, keep growing. They got 10 feet this year, you know, grow up eight feet and then grew back down almost all the way to the ground. I mean, really uh, get crazy big. So, um, let's see, mine's done, so cold and wet, busy girl. Yeah, it's pretty much cold and wet. Uh, Jason says, I have rabbits, didn't know parasites were an issue. I'm always handling it and have used hundreds of pounds of it. Yeah, I'm in the same category. We used to keep rabbits on the mountain and stuff, and so uh, I've never had any issues whatsoever with any kind of parasites in rabbit manure. In fact, rabbit manure is the one that you can use fresh right now. You can make a tea with it, um, and drink it. No, I'm just kidding. You can make a tea with it and add, feed it to the plants immediately. Uh, and you can incorporate it into the soil right away. It's that, it's that mild. So let us see. MMC, what kind of plants can I grow over the winter? Where do you live? Where do you live? Because that will depend, everything will depend upon that. If you're in Northern Indiana, zone 5B, 6A, or higher, uh, you know, further north, then nothing. You pretty much can't grow anything. Okay, Massachusetts, you're probably not going to be growing much of anything then, uh, because without like a greenhouse, of course. And then it's is it a is it a passive heated greenhouse? How are you heating the greenhouse? Greenhouses seem like a great idea, but in, if it's not like the Wallapini style, then uh, you know, which is in the ground or the straw bale method. Yes, Jerry. Um, so if it's not one of those methods that is very cleverly insulated and stuff with the heat sink, you know, uh, line, the barrels lining the north side of the wall full of water to absorb the, the, um, to absorb the heat during the daytime and release it during the nighttime. If there's not that kind of thing, then even the greenhouse, an unheated greenhouse in zone five is going to be you're not going to get much from it because the, the minimum temperature at the nighttime is still going to be just the same as it is outside unless you're heating it, which is a whole different ball game. I'm trying to put a compost bin in my greenhouse and heat it that way. Very nice. Very nice. I have wanted to do that. I have not yet had experience with that. Okay. But I have seen it done by people that I trust their uh, methods so I definitely wanted to try that. Now, the only thing I'm wondering is, man, it would be tough to keep the rats out of there because any of the, inse or the insects or the rats, 
they're gonna see that and they're gonna think, man, a nice, toasty, insulated, warm house full of uh, food for us? My goodness, jackpot, I'm moving in. You know, uh, and that's not gonna be cool. So let me know how that goes for you, how it, if it actually does heat. You know, I've seen the methods where the people put the three quarter inch poly line, you know, coil that up and put that all up in the pile and stuff. You just have to make sure you have enough thermal mass. It's gonna take serious thermal mass in order to heat a greenhouse with the compost pile. So you're gonna to want to make sure that it's plenty big. Don't just have a little pile of stuff and think that that's gonna do anything, okay? Based upon my experience with composting, it actually takes a lot of mass to get that sort of uh, heat that you're gonna want, okay? And uh, let's see. I just, uh, let's see, okay, okay. I'm trying, that's a mirror, Jason. Let's see, what were you guys talking about? Contritional, okay, hey Nate, who is behind you? What? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, you're right, that's a mirror. Okay, I wanted to see what you guys were talking about. Uh, yeah, no one is behind me, my friends. And can you help recommend an indeterminate brand of tomato that will do well in Africa, tropical weather? Best type of indeterminate tomato, my friends, that will grow vigorously and will yield ridiculously is the purple bumblebee, okay? I think it's a newer strain from the artesian seeds, but you can get it at like um, Baker Creek Seeds, which is rareseeds.com. The purple bumblebee, my friends, that thing, uh, everywhere that I've um, uh, installed that plant, it has thrived. It has been the craziest, most vigorous of all the plants, and it has yielded, and the fruit is resistant to cracking. It doesn't matter if it's bone dry, and then it, and then it get a heavy rain, it still doesn't crack, uh, it, and it tastes really good. But the first half of the season, the flavor is kind of, is a little bit lacking in comparison to the last half of the season. The purple bumblebee, it, it, the flavors come into full swing, and it is unbelievably good. It's so complex and tangy. So that is what I recommend to you, my friends. Uh, my favorite tomato in general is the Cherokee purple, but the plant itself, the Cherokee purple, is actually very weak. It just isn't that strong of a plant in comparison to like the purple bumblebee. So um, I wouldn't recommend that. Garth says, compost only heats for a short time. So what will you do for heat after 30 days? Correct, you will have to keep adding to that, of course. But yeah, the hotter that you get it, the uh, sooner that is going to uh, need replenishment. But yeah, you're gonna, so you're gonna have to have a supply of organic matter, uh, lots of nitrogen. If you want it hot, you're gonna have to have lots of the green material. So um, you would have to sort of have that on deck, you know, and you could use the uh, homemade urea slash urine, um, dump that on it, and that will help the nitrogen source, but that wouldn't make a very good ambiance in the greenhouse, you know. This hot pile of piss-soaked uh, leaves and greens, it's, it just doesn't sound like a place you want to go in and, ah, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe you do. Uh, so, okay, thanks. I think I'll try Purple Bumblebee. Yes, definitely give it a try. And then let me know. Go, wow, yeah, it's, um, that would be, or let me know your results with that. It would be too humid in the greenhouse. If what, Chad? Um, is that a double A? The length of daylight also greatly affects rate of growth. Absolutely, that is very true. Uh, and I forgot, I have not mentioned that with the, um, the greenhouse stuff. So yes, the, the length of daylight, and the, especially the further north that you get, the daylight hours are waning. I mean, there's not much daylight. And the daylight that is there is very low in the UVB spectrum. It is also very just weak in compared, comparison to the midsummer when it's close to, you know, as high up ahead as it can get really intense. Because remember, plants are solar powered. So they get 100% of their uh, caloric needs, we'll say, from the sun. The only food for a plant is the sun. Everything else is like a multivitamin. And so uh, with less sunlight, they're going to be spending a lot of hours in the dark, cold. So it's tough. It can be tough, you know, growing in that, in that manner. But it can definitely be done, no doubt. I'm just saying, you asked, someone asked what can be grown over winter, and um, here we don't grow anything over winter. Outside. Inside, we're growing mushrooms, microgreens, sprouts, uh, all different kinds of stuff. 
And that actually leads me into uh, my next topic because I got a few things that I wanted to show you guys. Um, so if I haven't answered your question, just ask it again, okay? Um, because there's like a lot of questions coming up and that's, that's good, that's good. Uh, so the, uh, I wanted to show you guys the, uh, here we go, check it out, hold on, I will get it. And um, here we will see. This is the, uh, for those of you that is into the mushrooms, I just was showing you guys this. Uh, you see the uh, look at the gauge you see after three days and I haven't done any it's been like four days actually maybe even five and I haven't done anything to this and it's still at like 80% humidity the lion's mane is growing well and this is the method that because I just released a video on how to make your own fruiting chamber three different methods from budget to baller this is the middle method and uh, this is probably what most people are going to choose and that's cool. Um, so the perlite, we soak it with the water because the perlite is going to slowly uh, release the humidity into the air. That's how we get it. Even though it's only like 40% humidity in here in the house, it's like 80 to 90 in this chamber. And uh, that's why we so that's why we soak the perlite. Now we will have to um, we will have to do this right here every few days. We will open it up and we will um, have to take like a spray bottle, you know, and we'll spray it with the water. And we'll, we'll, we'll miss the mushrooms and stuff with the water. And uh, that is going to help us to maintain the environment that we need um, for the mushrooms, the high humidity and the good airflow. And you see, that is how you get the beautiful uh, lion's mane like this. How it is just really, really, you see those nice cascading uh, things right there? That's the shagginess of the lion's mane. So this one is totally ready. And uh, this one is just starting to drop its spores. So I'm literally going to harvest this. I'm actually going to harvest this today. Um, maybe even on camera for you guys. But yes, I was just showing you this because this is a good method. Now, why are we drilling the half inch holes in here? or the two inch holes, I mean, and not a bunch of small holes, because it may come that we find that this is too much air circulation and we can't maintain high enough humidity. So we are going to, um, we have these big holes so that we can then stuff them with something like um, fluffy cotton or something like this. And we'll put inside of here. Uh, and that's going to block up a couple of these holes you see so we can adjust it that way and I'll make a video on how to do that uh, in the future I was just showing you guys that now so that you get a better idea so if you have any uh, questions about that the uh, tub method for the cultivation do not hesitate to ask and I can uh, talk I can talk about them on the live stream or whatever needs to be so let's see polyfill yeah exactly that's what I'm talking about um, is so let us see yes are you on twitter am i on twitter no i am not uh, i'm not on twitter or instagram and we don't have a patreon or anything like that um but here's why we don't have a patreon my friend because look i just want to give you a shout out real quick to these people uh who are making like monthly contributions to the channel just through the paypal account this is why we don't need to um this is why we don't need to make a you know, privatize the information. We can just uh, trust people that they are going to donate based upon their means. Joanne, thank you very much for your consistent contribution. Mike, Valerie, Shelly, Brian, Judith, Maria from Central Florida, Linda, Samantha, Kevin, Sean, Micheline or Micheline or Michaelin. Maybe it's Michaelin like this. All of you guys, plus many more, have been uh, contributing to the channel, and I thank you very much, my friends. Everyone thanks you, because that's how we can keep the videos coming, because this is actually turning into a full-time gig for me, because I've got, uh, it's just a full-time gig. I mean, it is a lot of energy and work making these uh, videos, actually, guys. So uh, the contributions help me to be able to like focus more energy on that. And it will especially be true in come like the springtime and stuff. We're going to be doing all kinds of new videos because I got all these ideas and stuff, how we can improve on everything that we've done so far. It's just fantastic. So, um, yes, big shout out to all of you guys. Thank you, my friends. And Nate, I would love to see you harvest the shroom. And 
and see how you go about getting it ready to eat. Yeah, uh, that would be, oh man, I should have prepared that. I should have prepared that uh, and we could have done it like right here. Maybe I'll get a little hot plate next time or use my camping stove and we'll literally do it right here as we're talking. That would be cool. Uh, but to harvest it, it's gonna be very simple. Uh, I don't wanna do it. I'm gonna take a real sharp uh, pair of scissors probably. Man, it is just so unbelievably beautiful. This, the mane on this one is just out of this world. Do you see the shagginess? of uh that is a sign of good airflow high humidity and they are loving life okay they are really loving life this the shaggy lion's mane but see they're starting to drop their spores so it's it's time it's definitely time um and so yeah i, I would almost just peel it off right now but it's like i don't want to disrespect it by that i want to give it more attention i don't want to just do it hastily in the moment you know so uh, because we're going to get a third flush from this. We're, we are definitely going to get a third flush from this because, uh, but see, it's starting to dry up and you can feel it's a little bit lightweight. Um, but we just put it into the chamber and it's going to keep producing for us. Now I wanted to make, I wanted to, uh, suggest to you guys though, that, uh, or not suggest, but to bring to your attention that this is not the same as the, the, um, bags of spawn so the lion's mane spray and grow kit is a, is a substrate that has been inoculated so that we can just grow right out of it we can fruit right out of it the spawn bags you don't cut those open those are not the kind that you grow right out of okay so you uh we are going to use the spawn bag like the yellow oyster spawn to inoculate the buckets okay remember that uh, and we're going to utilize the food grade buckets so you've watched the other two videos i've just made and we're going to utilize the uh food grade five gallon and then the two and a half gallon buckets depending on what you want to do um, and then we're going to turn that into a lot more uh, mushrooms and we will they are beautiful i am a shroom hunter oh, well wonderful so you can see yes uh, can you collect the spores instead of buying every time now you can yo oh, absolutely yes you can and back in the day that's how we had to do it but uh, there's various levels to it, you know, to make, but to make a spore print, to actually take this and make more mushroom culture from this is a delicate process, is a delicate process in the sense that uh, everything has to be very clean. You need like the laminar flowing hood, you know, it, you have to do it in a condition that is very sterile. So for most people, if I started with that, nobody would want to do um the mushrooms everybody and everybody would have failure in the beginning if we started with trying to make your own spore prints and then inoculate your own uh grain spawn and then to take that and inoculate a substrate yes we will be doing all that but in the future with you guys because uh right off the bat it's just way easier and way more effective and foolproof to just get the bag of spawn from the north spore company using the garden using the code the promo code garden viking for 10 percent off yes and uh it's so much easier because they've already done the laboratory work and then we can just take that and do the the clean work you know we want to make sure we're clean while we're doing it and that the area is clean but it doesn't have to be totally sterile like like it would be if we're doing the spore prints and all of that okay um and i want you guys to have a very positive first experience with growing mushrooms that's important just for, for someone to maintain, for someone to be enthused about something and want to maintain it in their life, they have to have positive experiences with it at first, I found. Um, unless you're like really, unless you're like me, where you don't even care. If, if you have horrible experiences, it just doesn't matter. It's all part of the learning process. Once I set out to do it, it's getting done in some way or another. Um, the lion's mane looks amazing. So excited to be doing this. Can't wait to get the rest of my supplies for the next step. Taida, yes, yes, yes. The lion's mane is gonna be so good. And guys, it tastes just delicious. So we will pull this thing off and I like to flatten it between like two plates or two, um, two uh, like a, a tortilla press, something like that, or two frying pans press it real good and it squeezes the water out of it, okay? And that is going to allow it to, so then we will fry it uh, dry for a little bit. We'll fry it without anything in the pan. We'll just fry it and, and it's gonna uh, cook off more of that water. 
And then once it's nice and starting to get crisp a little bit, then we add the butter for a last few minutes, uh, maybe five, five or 10 minutes into butter. And that's gonna give us that crispy crust, the crispy edge on both sides. And it's gonna be just like, like fried crab meat. It's gonna taste like a crab cake in many ways. Okay, so uh, except just delicious and um, it's not the bottom feeder of the ocean, okay? So, yes, um, and also we'll be cooking the, um, the uh, oyster mushrooms like this in the same way, you know, we're gonna be doing all kinds of stuff like that. I just wanna keep showing it because it's just so beautiful, uh, I know. And I'm just looking at this sh shaggy little mane uh, and we're going to learn how to make, um, you know, medicine with this, my friends. Okay, I need to put it down because otherwise I'm just gonna be sitting here stroking the lion's mane. Thanks for the recipe. I would not have cooked the shrooms like that. Yeah, that's the way I like to do it. Pretty much with all mushrooms, um, I, I like to, well, you cook them for a long time, for sure. You know, you cook them, you don't eat raw mushrooms. At least I don't, and I don't recommend it. But yes, the, uh, the good way to do it is to cook them first with no oil or anything to get that water out. Because otherwise, a lot of people will try to saute mushrooms and they'll end up with this soupy kind of mess and they're like rubbery and stuff. But if you do it this way, to where you just press, uh, press the, the moisture out of them first and then cook them dry, uh, they're, they're gonna be very, very delicious. Uh, because then you add the butter and the salt if you want uh, after all of that. And so, man, it sets it off, my friends. And, and it's a real beautiful gift of the, uh, the winter time and it's just magnificent. So if you're, if you're into it, you're into it, you know? Okay, okay, Nate, you know what to do with mushrooms. Yes, my friend, Sicily, thank you. I uh, have much experience with the eating of the mushroom. Uh, where do you get food grade buckets? I've just gotten mine from the uh, like Lowe's, Lowe's or Home Depot or any of that. They actually will sell them. They're food food safe, and that just means that they're not go they're going to be made with a certain type of um, plastic that is not going to leach nutrients. Now you'll see a lot of people not using food food grade plastics for mushrooms, so of course it's possible. But me, I think that because the mushroom is such a fantastic digester. It's a decomposer of material. It's, it's nature's way of breaking things down. Uh, you don't want it to um, break down any of the plastic stuff, you know? So the food grade is gonna, is gonna really um, help you with that, okay? To make sure that it's not gonna leach anything. Ingrid's Kitchen says salt will pull the moisture out. That's right, that's right. Salt also helps to pull the moisture out. Uh, Linnea says go to a bakery. They'll give you icing buckets for free. That's cool. You must know a very uh, nice bakery. I guarantee you the ones around here would charge you. So what's the discount code? Garden Viking. Yes, Garden Viking, you get 10% off. And let us see here. There was a couple more messages here. Food grade buckets at Walmart. Yes, Matt Barker, they do have those. And um, sorry I am late. Pam, Pam says, sorry I am late. I will watch this awesome video from the beginning. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Pam. Shout out to you at minute 5311. Uh, Mike D says, Nate, I made your fish fertilizer concoction with the bucket and hose. Something knocked over my cup of water and thus was no longer airtight. Messed up, messed up for up to a week, maybe? Think it's still good? Yes, absolutely, it's still good. Uh, the airlock for the um, fish fertilizer is primarily because I did it, I put mine in the basement. I did it inside. And so, it, and it just eliminates the smell. And so that is why I've done the airlock on that. You can, it's okay if it's just breathing. This is not like a, the type of ferment, like we're making wine or something like that, that, it, that has to be, you know, uh, can't receive any oxygen or anything or something like that. This, uh, these, most of these are conditionally anaerobic anyways, these microbes, which meaning that they can function either with or without oxygen. And that's actually a big thing that most people don't know when they start, because so many people, you know, on the channel or in the comments and stuff already are like, no, you want to add an air stone to these because uh, the anaerobic bacteria is going to be harmful to the to blah, blah, blah. And I understand what they're saying because they've learned this from the mainstream sources and the scientists um, that, that are, you know, they, they understand science and chemistry, but they don't understand growing and biology so much. And so the... Um, this is nothing against any of them. Of course, I'm just saying from my experience and from my intuitive knowing 
is that um, most of the, and this scientifically I do know, that most of the um, microorganisms are facultative anaerobes or conditionally anaerobic, which means that they can survive with or without oxygen. There's actually not that many of them that are strictly either with air or without air. You know, so that is not nearly of an, as important of a uh, concept as people think it is. Uh, the bakery I worked at accumulated so many buckets, they threw them away. I asked them to fill some with spent coffee grounds. Twofer. Man, that's like a win-win. Free food-grade buckets full of spent coffee grounds? Yes, definitely. Pickle buckets from a local restaurant are food safe and free. Thank you, River City Doodles, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, I was just out in Chattanooga. So, uh, okay, another couple things is that, um, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Oh yes. And we will, so we will be doing then the, uh, oh yeah. Okay. A couple more things. So you're going to want to get a spray bottle like this for the mushrooms. You want to get the spray bottle because you're going to be having to spray, uh, either the tub or the, uh, definitely the, the bag method. So you want some kind of a thing that you can pump up and put onto a fine mist setting. That is very important. Uh, and then we are going to be doing, oh, Hey, look, if you guys want a really cool book to read, the book I'm reading right now, Breathe by James Nestor. Actually, I just finished reading it and I just sort of made a little bit of a um, summary of it on my other channel, Nate Murray, where I um, uh, do these kind of videos as well. But I tell you a little bit more about it. It's super important, a uh, really good book to read if you're into it. And also, As a Man Thinketh. Uh, I made an audio book where I read this entire thing to you guys, actually. Uh, so if you want to check that out, those are on my other channel, Nate Murray. And this is what I wanted to show you because we are going to be starting microgreens, but that's not going to be for another few weeks. Uh, and the microgreens, okay, so if you're in the industry and you use the, 10 to, the 1020 trays, the, the black trays, you know how when you pick them up, they essentially can disintegrate, okay? They can disintegrate. And uh, those trays can be really flimsy. And therefore, you have to constantly buy new ones and the price has risen on those and i'm talking the black trays you know and so uh and they'll last like a year or a season or two maybe and then they'll always get holes and they're they're just flimsy and they're like three dollars a piece now or 250 to three dollars a piece now well let me show you this uh from <clears throat> and i'll put a link to this in the description no i'm not affiliated with this person but i just think it's fantastic from Bootstrap Farmer, uh, these trays are amazing. So I ordered a number of them and because they're heavy duty, reusable plastic trays. And I was like, well, we'll see, you know, but they are unbelievable. These trays are heavy duty. I mean, they are, you are not gonna be replacing these that often. There's, so you, I, you will definitely get multiple seasons out of these, no doubt. And you can lift it up and it doesn't just collapse. You know, because and we'll, we'll utilize these when we do uh, the microgreens, the wheatgrass, and also in the springtime when we go to start up our new plants. These are going to be ideal, guys. So the best way to do it, and I'll show you, is to get the 1020 trays with um, with uh, no holes in the bottom. Okay, because we we like to bottom water when we're doing indoor stuff. We really like to bottom water. That's the best. So we're gonna get. Uh, We'll say, for example, a 10 pack of the trays with no holes of the heavy duty ones, and then a five pack of the trays with, uh, with holes in them, you see? And then we put the one in the other and we'll put our, this will be for like wheatgrass or also uh, for our soil blocks when we go to seed start this spring. Uh, and then we will just simply bottom water. We'll lift up and add the certain amount of water and then we'll put it back down and it will seep up into the roots and that's really helpful for eliminating mold because mold is the number one enemy of indoor growing and so here we go and this is so heavy duty it's incredible and then so you got your 10 pack of the ones without the holes and then your five pack of the ones with the holes but then you get a 10 pack of the these the smaller ones uh, with the holes so this is what we're going to do when we do the uh, micro greens we're going to put two of them into a tray like this and we'll have like broccoli microgreens and then cabbage microgreens or you know we'll be able to rotate it 
because this is quite a bit of microgreens. You know, it, one of these is better than trying to grow a whole 10, 20 tray, unless you've got a big family or you're giving them away to a bunch of people. So that's what I suggest. Uh, just letting you guys, clean you guys into that because it's very uh, useful to have the good stuff. You know, I love high quality equipment, but I do not love, the opposite of love, cheap equipment. You know, unless it's, unless there's a purpose for it being cheap, like it's so, it's so much less expensive. Um, you can buy heavy duty 1020 trays from Ontario Seed Company. They don't break. Okay, very nice. Uh, everyone, Ontario Seed Company apparently also sells them. Uh, I don't know about those ones, but I do know about these ones from Bootstrap Farmer, where uh, I'm feeling them, and I can tell you right away, I've had years of experience with these trays just collapsing on me. These are not collapsing. These are very heavy duty. So I was pleased with that, uh, definitely. And Bootstrap Farmer has the best 1020 trays for microgreens, organic clean food connection. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, and I know you know what you're talking about with that. So Graham, what up my friend? Hi, Nate just arrived. Miss first hour, getting sloppy. Yeah, getting sloppy. What time is it there in the old Ireland? Okay, a few more things I'm doing. Um, guys, and this book, uh, and I think all this stuff's super interesting, okay? It just pertains to life in general, but this book, okay? Check out my other channel for, for a summary of it and stuff, but it tells you about how one of the biggest things that, one of the biggest health problems that we have uh, is the soft food. And uh, our ancestors, how they used to chew so much more than we do now. And that has caused all kinds of issues with the, the mouth, narrowing of the mouth, the crowding out of the teeth, and the blockage of the nasal passages. And so when, and this guy, and I'm paraphrasing all this real briefly for you guys, but read the book. And uh, he goes through and e examines skulls from the past, from our di distant ancestors, and then recent ancestors and like this. And you can see the distant ancestors, none of them had crooked teeth of any kind. And it was really, they all had real wide, well-formed jaws because their diet still had to chewing um, effects. So, and I'm paraphrasing that because most of the other knowledge in the book, I already had a grasp on, but this is totally new knowledge to me as far as the chewing aspect. And so what do I do? Of course, I look into it and I find, okay, what can I do to chew more? And so I found through the rabbit hole, I found the Tears of Hios, a tree resin from Greece that is 15 times harder than any kind of chewing gum. And so the past week I've been chewing this stuff. I'll just put like three pieces in my mouth, let it warm up and then have a workout. It's like a workout. Right? Mm, 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 mm. And you chew, you know, equal amount on both sides and then about 20% in the front like that. And after about an hour of that, I'll put it down. Whoa, and the face is like, it feels like after a good workout, like when you're like, whoa, okay, you, you, you work chest or something, or if you work legs, you have a good run or something like that. And for days afterwards, that muscle group just feels good. It feels tight and it feels alive and filled with mineral rich blood and stuff. That's how my face feels this past week. So the jury is still out on the long-term uh, benefits, but immediate benefits is, man, it feels good. You know, my teeth don't, I mean, they don't hurt anyways, but they just feel great. So highly recommend that stuff, guys. Uh, maybe I'll put a link to this stuff as well if you want to get some. You can use it over and over and over, and it never loses flavor, okay? It tastes like a pine, sort of like citrus, or not, not citrus, but a cedar, cedar wood. It's really... Um, delicious and it's antibacterial antimicrobial all of this good stuff okay um it's uh graham says it's 17 it's 505 just starting to get dark now weather is very warm for this time of year i've got strawberries growing and ripening it's incredible wow you know when i think of where you live I, in the coast or in ireland and stuff i'm thinking it's overcast most of the time is that accurate i'm feeling like it's probably sort of mild and cool but overcast and so if you don't get a lot of hot dryness would that be right but maybe you think it's hot and dry but somebody in oregon would not think it's hot and dry or arizona successful garden design fellow youtuber she says lol i did exactly the same and gave myself toothache for weeks afterwards might have overdone it a bit yeah and i thought about the same thing uh you know, don't want to, because I overdo everything, but that's how I always, that's how you find the upper limit. You know, that's my philosophy. How are you going to know how much is enough or too much if you don't like push it a little bit? Uh, but so far, 
an hour to even two hours a day has been, just been wonderful. It's been really good. So um, let's see. And I don't have a lot, but I mix them in my compost and everything grows fine. I have to grow an 18 gallon totes and five gallon buckets. Oh, that's a side conversation. Uh, Organic Clean Food says they also make low profile trays for more airflow. Yes, they uh, do make the, the low profile trays. And that might be something that I'll be testing out for the microgreens. However, I know that these will uh, translate very well to the soil blocks. And because that's what we're also, everything has to have multiple purposes and multiple uses. So we're going to utilize these trays for the soil blocks. And I don't see the real, the low profile ones working that well for the soil blocks. Um, you know, because the low profile ones are like this. So yeah, I'll probably get some of them low profile ones just so I can test it out. And then I'll let you guys know uh, what's up with that. But yeah, some of my, uh, some of my uh, microgreen seeds came in. So uh, I got a couple of pounds of the mammoth red rock cabbage. You know, this one I really like because it adds a nice purple hue to everything. So if you like the purple colors and stuff and you, again, the, the key to thriving is to have the widest diversity of mineral, vitamin, mineral and nutrition sources of clean quality ones into the body. Okay. And so uh, growing different colors of things also has different nutrients. And so we are going to grow regular cabbage microgreens. Uh, see, we'll do one tray of regular cabbage microgreens and then this one of the red cabbage microgreens. And so even though they're both cabbage, they've got a different spectrum of minerals and phytonutrients because of the colors that are involved and many other factors. I could get deep into that. Uh, but, oh yeah, here is some organic uh, Sango purple radish. Again, I like the purple because um, it adds a good pop to things. But... Uh, I'm not that into radishes. I just want to be because they're the fastest, easiest microgreen to grow. But I just got this little four ounce package or one ounce package so that I could show you guys about them because they just, some people like radishes. I don't want to diss on them or anything like that. Um, okay. But one thing I know that I like is the buckwheat. Okay. The buckwheat microgreen. So I went ahead and got like five pounds of that because um, I didn't have any more of those. So the buckwheat is a really good one. Uh, I can eat a lot of that stuff. Very, very nourishing. I can juice it. I can put it into smoothies. Uh, not really juice. I don't really juice it. I put it into smoothies though. And I eat it uh, in chunkonabe soups and stuff like that. So uh, you guys can get that. Also get the alfalfa, the clovers, also broccoli, black oil sunflower. Although true leaf is completely out of the black oil sunflowers, which is like mind blowing because that's like number one. They should be stocked up on that. Uh, but my favorite microgreen period is the pea shoot. So get the green pea or the dun pea and uh, those. We're going to grow those so that, uh, man, this thing just keeps pulling this string down. Let's try and put it on the other side. Uh, yeah, we're going to be growing the dung peas, uh, or the, the pea shoots, and those are really delicious. They taste like full-size peas. So um, that's something really good to get if you guys like. And, uh, okay, so let's see. What else is there? What else uh, do we got going on, my friends? Any questions? Uh, Nate, is your other channel linked in one of your videos? Uh, not really, but I, I could. Uh, I should, shouldn't I? I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Uh, to that channel but it's also if you just go to my channel page my actual channel then uh, and you scroll to the very bottom it says my other channels and I have a link to the Nate Murray and to the saga of Nate Murray um, and the stuff on Nate Murray is going to be like flow of consciousness things you know kind of more like a podcast type stuff we can talk about all different kinds of stuff here I like to keep it mostly focused to the gardening of course because it's gardening like a viking uh, but there's so much more to life to that I am into that I would like to talk about and that I know about and that I like to learn about so that's what that channel is for um, And we can talk about all kinds of different things and remember guys. I'm completely nonpartisan I don't get involved in politics or anything like that So even if some topics might seem like they're politically cited or motivated, they're not they're just my uh, neutral my experience my observations based upon my life experience and I just say what I know to be true and that's that um, okay, busy girl, you guys are having a good conversation on the side. That is really good. How do you deal with gnats when growing indoors? Uh, gnats when growing indoors. Yeah, well, you want to keep them uh, clear from the place. You want to use uh, clean 
um, techniques and you want to use, uh, I like the tents, you know, the tent method because they've got screens all over everything. Um, but mainly you don't want to have the conditions where they're going to be um, attracted. So you don't want to have sopping wet medium. You don't want to have lack of airflow. You don't want to have anything that is starting to decay or anything that's going to attract them. So you just want fresh, clean growth, uh, good ventilation and clean practices. And that should really take care of them for the most part. If you're getting gnats consistently, then you have to look at something into your, in your system. And I'll show you when those videos start coming out, we'll show all about that. Um, but for now, I got to get everyone focused on the mushrooms because we got to inoculate our buckets and then that's going to take a while. Uh, we're going to let them sit and, and, and colonize. The mycelium is going to colonize the substrate and then that's going to be about two to three weeks and then we're going to fruit them into the fruiting chamber. But just get your fruiting chamber ready because so many times people will want to, oh yeah, okay, I got the mushrooms and then they'll just keep putting off the fruiting chamber until all of a sudden their mushrooms are fruiting and they have no fruiting chamber ready. You got to get it ready first. Um, let's see. Ahmed Sa says, I am a master student in college of agriculture. Tomorrow I am giving a presentation regarding using compost in the garden. Why would the heat kills off bad bacteria, not the good ones in compost? Now that is a very good, uh, that is a very good question. And why is that? Why do we believe that to be true? And if you read the books, like I have a book over there, uh, teeming with nutrients and teeming with microbes. And they are a, uh, scientist, basically a kind of scientist, and they, um, advocate hot composting because it will kill the bacteria. Now they, I just don't subscribe any longer to the school of dividing the bacteria into good or bad. Nature never divides like that. It is all one and everything is kept in balance as one unless we disrupt the balance through uh, Ill, Ill practice. And so it has been my experience, there is no need to hot compost uh, other than if you want to kill the seeds. That is the number one thing that if you're using weeds or plants with seeds in them and you don't hot compost, you're gonna be spreading a lot of seeds. That is true. Uh, but as far as the microbial content, the nutrients, there is, I don't care who is, there is no way that they can say with confidence that hot composting kills only the bad bacteria and not the good ones. There's no way they can tell. We don't even remotely, I'm talking we as in scientific body, we don't even remotely understand even a fraction of the, the diversity or the life of, uh, of microorganisms, okay? And, and the true functioning of them. We can't even begin to. And so we have theories on it and stuff. So I can't say for sure, but I can say that nature ten generally never hot composts and it never separates between good and the bad bacteria. It keeps everything in balance. So what I recommend is we do uh, some hot composting if you need to, but we never use a compost thermometer and worry about all that stuff. We don't need to worry about that. It doesn't matter if it gets hot. That's cool. The outside won't get that hot. Uh, if it gets, if it, um, stays cold, that's fine too. We will add the microbial solution, uh, the JDOM microbial solution, and that is going to help keep everything in balance. And we won't have any issues. Now, that being said, remember what I said about the weeds. If, if you want to, uh, you will have to, um, you might want to hot compost for the weeds or just be, pre be prepared to do a weed, ha have something in um, ready for the weeds or the volunteer plants. You know, if you compost everything, you'll have squash and cucumbers popping up all over the place, which that's fine, you know, uh, a certain amount of stuff, but you can just go through and wipe them out, you know, early in the spring. Uh, Lukash says, I messed up my lion's mane. Oh no, thought it was too dry because it was brown and oversprayed, LOL. Epic first time mushroom grower fail. What, what makes you think that you uh, messed it up though? So. Uh, because it was brown, you must have thought that uh, the brown was, uh, well, you must have thought that the substrate was a, a mess up in some way. But no, you will just, it takes about two weeks after you cut the hole in it, it's going to start growing. And then once it pops out of the plastic is when you need to start spraying it. Uh, but if it's brown like this, that is um, just it dropping its spores. Okay, but this, oh my gosh, man, if you could feel the texture of this thing, it is just so... Incredible. See, I can't start touching this thing because I just, I, I'm like a child. I just wonder at it. 
uh, it's all brown. Okay, so like dark brown. Okay, so that means that there's not nearly enough humidity. That means there's not nearly enough humidity. Um, so you want to put a bag over it and drowning it with the sprayer is also not the way because it, you, they only absorb like a mist. So make a mono tub and um, if it's all brown, try cutting it off. Okay, cutting all of it off. You can take a knife, cut it down like that and then put the bag over it and uh, utilize the methods from the last video I, I watched or the last video I just made, the three different methods. Utilize one of those methods to keep the humidity high and just let it recolonize and let it fruit again, okay? Uh, it's not all lost. So um, unless there's like black mold, black fuzzy black mold growing on it, then, um, you know, an emergency measure would be you could take the thing, you could take the whole bag out and then, uh, you know, cut the opposite side and uh, fruit that side. Put that into, just put the bag without the box into the tub. That would also probably work. You know, but it's not, all is not lost. So there's still life within this thing. The mushrooms are still growing. Do not, I mean, they are survivors. So go ahead and uh, re-fruit it, okay? And then let me know how it goes. Taida says, oh my, I am exactly like that with my lion's mane. Oh, I know. You're just looking at it. Wow. Especially when you get a real nice one that's got that good shaggy mane on it. And that's a sign that you got the good environment. Oh, I'm going to, this one's going to be delicious. Ms. P says, yes, any good soil scientist will admit we hardly know anything about the life in the soil. Thank you, my friend. And that is the way I feel as well. And you have to be aware if people of the people that are saying, uh, well, this is how it is. And I know exactly how it is. And uh, th this happens in the soil. And then this exactly happens. And they say it in a way that is um, foregone conclusion, matter of factly which that's not true, my friends. So we have to uh, respect the fact that we don't know. And guys, it's perfectly acceptable in life to not know something, to, to have an, you don't have to formulate an opinion and you don't have to pretend like you know if you don't actually know. It's perfectly acceptable to say, I don't actually know, but based upon my life experience or based upon my current level of understanding, this is what I believe to be true. And that's about as close as we can really get anyways in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, beware the ones that think in absolute terms. Lukash, no, just dark brown. There was water in the bag, so I'm going to read it and cut it like Nate says. Happy it's not a total loss. Yeah, definitely not a total loss. So uh, cut it on the other side and then place it that side down into the fruiting chamber. And you saw the fruiting chamber, right? Do you want me to show you again? Uh, well, just watch the video that I just made and um, do it that way or put the bag over it you know cut some holes in the bag do one of those two methods and you will have success no worries um, patricia i bought shin Terrells, but it came in a seed packet what it says on the instructions to plant outside i would prefer to plant inside do you think if i sprinkle in a substrate i will have success i don't know exactly i've never seen chanterelles for sale uh, they're kind of like morels ones that um it's very difficult to grow them uh indoors and to inoculate at will so what i would say is uh grow them yes if i received a pack of chanterelles something claiming to be chanterelles and they look like seeds i would inoculate a growing medium with them uh, even though chanterelles i don't think that they can side fruit though i don't think see the reason that we can grow these in buckets is because in nature they colonize decaying trees so it'll go into the tree and it'll colonize the inside of the tree until the mycelium colonizes fully and then it reaches the surface. And once it reaches the surface, it, it triggered by light and oxygen, it says, okay, we've reached the surface. Now's the time to fruit. And so it'll fruit off the side of the tree. Imagine this is the tree trunk. And uh, mu oyster mushrooms are the same way. That's why we can do them out of buckets because they will fruit out of the side. Now chanterelles, I don't think that they can grow that way. So I think that they are a top fruiting variety. So still though, I would take a bucket like this. I would uh, sterilize, as I will show you in the future video, I would sterilize the growing medium. In that case, probably hardwood chips, like oak uh, or something, or beech, you know, something like that. And I would sterilize those chips, put them in here, and then I would uh, do, sprinkle the, uh, 
the whatever the chanterelle seeds I, I don't want to actually use that term because that can't possibly be what they are uh, but I would sprinkle that into the bucket and then I would allow it to colonize at like a 70 degrees uh, for a number of weeks. And then I would look every so often to see if the whole thing was fluffy white, if it was fully colonized, then at that point I would simply take the lid off and I would uh, put it into the fruiting chamber. And that way they could top sprout if they want to, you know, they could top grow. And then, then you can grow, you know, that's how you would grow the bottom or the top fruiting ones, ones that don't fruit vertically. You understand? Pam says, you learn by doing, so I am still learning. Oh, absolutely, man. If It's like a plant. If, if it's not growing, then it's decaying, which that's the cycle of things. And if you're not learning, then you're decaying in some ways, is my philosophy. I mean, not literally, but man, could you imagine a life where you just, well, I already know everything that exists. I already know everything that there is. So there's nothing more that I can learn. There's nothing more that anyone has to teach me. I am the only one that can teach anyone anything and what a boring existence and what a the spirit would be just dull yes uh double a some in trees lots in soil some what in trees lots in soil are you talking chanterelles in the trees uh chanterelles are mycorrhizae they need a specific kind of tree i think yeah i was gonna say the same thing uh roverino snarkum yeah i was gonna say the same thing they are um I don't know if the exact way to say it is that they are mycorrhiza, but I think that uh, they specifically need the roots, a certain type of roots in order to thrive. They actually colonize the roots of the trees, which, which by definition would seem like mycorrhiza, yes. They actually form the relationship with the roots of the trees and then they come up and fruit like that. And that's why we cannot grow them in buckets and stuff like that which would make sense because they need the certain type of food that only a living tree root of the right kind would uh, be able to emit. See, this is beautiful. <clears throat> okay, yes, that would make me crazy. Just shrooms in general, right? Shrooms in general. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm not sure what you're talking about, double A. Hello, everyone. Hello, Daryl. Uh, worldwide winners. We don't die, we transform. That's exactly correct, my friend. I say often uh, we are soil. We are soil rearranged and animated with the breath of life for a brief period, and then we return uh, to become the molecules will become something else at some point. And ultimately, I mean, if you want to get real, uh, go way, way back, every one of us was the molecules that inhabit us was formed in the heart of a star. Yes. So as Carl Sagan said, we are made of star dust, star stuff. And that is uh, true in so many ways. Go back, watch his other videos. I'm not sure. I can't do this in the ground. Moles for one and restoring my yard. Really bad storm. Nate has a nice garden plot and he shows what to do. Oh, Sharon Hockra. Okay. Uh, thank you, busy girl. Uh, thanks, Nate. Chanterelles. Okay. Some in trees. And does sodium bicarbonate eliminate, eliminate army worms from the, the corn plant? Does anyone have any experience with that? Baking soda, does it eliminate army worms from the corn maize plant? I don't know, David Mukasa. Uh, Bobby Anderson, we actually know anything. What we are, whence we came, where we're going from here. We know absolutely nothing. Bobby Anderson, that is one of the truest things that has been said today uh abs so we actually know we actually don't know anything and so that's what that's the only thing that the, the lifetime of pursuing knowledge of pursuing knowing and experimenting and experiencing has led me to the understanding that i cannot know i don't know anything i can't know anything in, in a way this we won't get that deep on this channel that's for the nate Murray channel but yeah uh, and then it's like a freedom by, by saying, uh, okay, imagine, imagine if somebody asks you a, a question, you know, uh, Hey, where is this, uh, exact specific place? I have to get there. And you, uh, you're like, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, okay. Let's think. And you're trying to think of it and you're all stressed out and you, you feel anxious and stuff. But then imagine if you just like, they ask you and you're like, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the freedom that you feel from that, that I don't know because you don't know and you're not trying to know. You're not trying to pretend like you know. And it, the feeling of that is really magnificent sometimes. Try that. 
Uh, double A. Shrooms are symbiotic. Some fruit on logs and other substrate. Others have their symbiotic relationship through the soil in proximity. Yes, absolutely. This is correct, my friend. I concur. Based on my experience and my knowledge, that is true as well. Val says, should I put JMS in the compost pile? Absolutely. Yes, especially a fresh compost pile. So when you will see that we will be making the leaf mold and the compost uh, stuff here next week and the week after, I'll make a couple of videos and that will, uh, yes, we will want to inoculate with the JMS if at all possible. So long as you're utilizing the good quality um, leaf mold. Okay. So yes, definitely everything can get soaked with the JMS. It's just beneficial because um, pathogen resistance is all about, or pathogen, it's all about suppression based upon uh, balance of microorganisms. And so that is really what we want is to have the widest diversity of microorganisms. And that is what keeps everything else in check. Just keep remembering that. Nature never separates out tiny little aspects of things and uses only that. That's only the mind of man that thinks it can uh, improve on things that have, has already been perfected. So Jerry, my friend says, uh, molasses for army worms, it blows them up. The sugar mist iron, the, the sugar or iron something, uh, molasses. Okay. So Jerry says molasses for army worms. It blows them up somehow. Okay. How would you apply? So Jerry, how would you utilize molasses for the army worms? If I wanted to do that, how would I apply that? Um, Ahmed says, when someone asks me for directions and I don't know the answer, I feel embarrassed to say I don't know, especially if it's a place close to where I live sometimes, I unfortunately give them wrong directions. That is so funny that you say that, my friend. That is a cultural thing, I feel like, because where are you from, Ahmed? Uh, where, where, where are you talking about? Because when I traveled through like Morocco uh, on my bicycle and I traveled through India and Nepal and Thailand and Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, and, and all that Sri Lanka, I traveled through so many places, but in particular, like Morocco and, and, uh, was a place where I would ask people for directions and they would always tell me a way. Uh, but, but it was often the wrong, I mean, totally wrong way. But, uh, and then somebody explained it to me. It's like, yeah, from them, they would, uh, I'm at, I'm from Iraq. Okay. So not exactly the same, but approaching more of a similar, somewhat similar culture than, than the West, you know? So yes, I feel like that's probably a cultural thing to just tell them because the people just, and in India as well, they'll do that as well. They just, oh yeah, yeah. They'll tell me the directions are, are dead wrong. And I, I, I got the feeling, then someone explained to me, uh, actually it is part of our culture that we would rather tell you something than not, than say that we don't know. Which, you know, that's not, so maybe that's not a perfect example, you know, uh, as far as feeling the relief from telling someone that you don't know, but, uh, or maybe it could be if you fully digest the fact and come, if you're comfortable with yourself and you say, Hey, I don't know, but it's like, Oh, but you should know, man, it's right down the road, you know? So I understand. Uh, exactly. They are like, LOL, you don't know the place where you are living in a cave, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Jerry says, mist it on or spray. Okay. What dilution? So, so let's give a specific example for the people. Uh, so uh, what dilution per like one gallon or one, one yeah, per one gallon, how much uh, molasses would we add to get rid of the army worms, to spray it on them? And thank you for your input, Jerry. Um, Val says, thanks, Nate. Uh, Barbara bada bada, says, I got some fox urine to ward off the squirrels and I didn't have to milk the fox. You didn't milk the fox? Oh. For it, LOL, hasn't stopped them from digging holes in my garden. They aren't eating my stuff, just digging. Really? I am shocked that that, maybe, maybe Fox wasn't a big enough predator. Maybe it was coyote, but no, the, uh, that's what I did in California. And that kept them away. I never had any more issues, uh, with rabbits as well, rabbits and squirrels, but I was using, yeah, I mean, it was like Fox coyote. Yeah, it was the lure though. I, I think we had this specific talk. It was the fox and coyote lure, the, the kind, I don't think it's the same as the urine. The lure is the kind, if you go to the hunting store and you go to the barbaric, like uh, leg traps and stuff like that, then they have the lure and that's what we used. So I don't know if it's different or what, what the difference would be, but um, 
there you go. So what could you use to deter coyotes? Ooh, to deter coyotes. Uh, well, you probably would have to utilize something like that because I don't know of anything else that would be really working. William Odell. Hello, Nate from Central Florida or Citra, Florida. Citra? Isn't that kind of stereotypical for Florida? Citrus? Um, Barbara says, I'll try lure next. Uh, Matt says, or deter hogs. We have a massive hog swallows as well. Man, the hogs are a major, major problem for a lot of you guys. I know that. I've seen the destruction and I've heard the stories. And uh, yeah, the best thing I know is the... Uh, 4570 lever action with the uh, thermal imaging night vision scope. Bah, that's how you do it. That's just how you have to do it. So uh, otherwise, you, they will destroy your stuff. Okay, I'm not all about. Obviously, you eat them as well, of course. But uh, I'm not all about you know just killing anything, of course. But again, if it's either uh, I I don't get a harvest or I eliminate this animal, then I'm going to eliminate the animal. If I just don't get a harvest and I have to feed myself and my family. The, the, um, the choice is very clear. So, okay, we're, we're getting close to the end, my friends. So let us uh, see. Busy girl, my main garden is in the front drive. Oh, you guys are having a side conversation. Okay, um, let's see. And learning sun, this mushroom block is dark brown on the inside also. Is that normal? Yes, absolutely it is, Lukash. Uh, am, I say, am I saying it right? Is it Lukash or is it Lucas? Uh, yeah, it depends where you're from, how, how that is pronounced. But yeah, the, uh, well, you can't really see it. But see, they've just got a bag of inoculated substrate inside. And uh, the lion's mane doesn't colonize as fully and thickly as, um, um, as the oysters do and stuff like that. So yes, the, uh, it's okay for it to be dark brown. Now, that just means that it's not fully colonized yet, but you're going to have perfect success. So I would take that. And I would uh, set the cut side down that's already been cut, place it, uh, and then cut the top of it, all right? But then you're going to have to place it in a, in a nice humid area, okay? So get the perlite and make the thing. Did you see it? Because I'll show you one more time just because uh, I feel like you need to see this because it's very important, okay? Uh, and so go ahead and you have to make you a chamber like this. And with the perlite and the holes in the side, and you see what the, uh, even though it's only 40% in here, it's, uh, you know, inside of this thing, it's like 80, 90%. And so if you just set that bag uh, and, and then cut the top of it inside of this thing, you're going to have really good success, okay? There's no way, because the mushroom is going to grow. I mean, that's what it does. The mushroom is going to decompose. Mushroom are very resilient. In fact, some scholars maintain that uh, life is spread throughout the cosmos by spores because spores which is the seed of the mushroom uh, are one of the very few living substances that can withstand space travel yes they can withstand the vacuum of space they can withstand the temperatures of space or lack thereof and it is entirely possible that spores travel from galaxy to galaxy on chunks of asteroids or exploding planets or whatever it is and land and colonize and become life on that planet and then terraform the planet and do all of that stuff it's entirely possible my friends the truth is we don't know you can't know because you weren't there so uh it's as plausible of a philosopher of a of a um it's as plausible as anything okay so uh by the way this mic is so good and you sound so clear and bassy oh thank you good thank you for telling me that because uh i'm always thinking that because I, I love good sound quality it's so important when i listen to podcasts and stuff like that which i do all the time uh man it's the worst to have bad audio it's just like man why can't you just invest in a better thing because i need to be able to hear it as though we're sitting in the room having a conversation if if it's if i'm sitting here and, and it sounds like i'm talking like this from you guys okay now can you sound how if the whole thing kind of sounded like this i mean that would be terrible and that's what some of the videos sound like and some podcasts even sound like that and i just shut it off immediately i say no nope, if you can't if you can't step your no okay so um very good uh sound is important uh what do you think about weed do you use it or plant it do you think it's a medicine or a drug? 
Well, Ahmed, my philosophy and my relationship with that plant has changed drastically over the years. When I was young, I used to use it all the time. Uh, and then when it became my job uh, in, many, in, well, in every way, uh, then it became like work. And then, uh, well, this all coincided with 10 years of, of major spiritual awakening. And then, you know, uh, about five years ago, I had a really profound um, spiritual awakening from the dream of life in many ways. And so from that point on, uh, I have never taken any kind of mind or mood altering substance whatsoever because I no longer need anything because I'm awake, I'm here and I'm fully coherent and clear and crisp and sharp and everything. And so uh, from that awakening uh, forward, I've never I, I stopped uh, any kind of, I don't drink or you know, any minor mood altering substance because there's just no need for it, you know? And so I'm not saying that anyone else should do it this way. I'm just saying with me, the desire for any of that stuff abruptly came to a complete stop because what is the point? I would never want to do anything to jeopardize the clarity that I have now. The, the, um, the peace that I have within me is just beyond value. I mean, it's totally priceless. And so I will never do anything to jeopardize that. So I hope that answers that. But if you want to do it, uh, you know, absolutely no problem whatsoever. I did for years. Uh, let's see. Panspermia is what they call the space seed theory. Yes, Chad, Wolfenschlagen, Steinhausen, Bergerdorf. Yes, that is uh, what they do call that. So look that up, Pans panspermia, um, who uh, after school, right? They made, a really good, um, they made a really good video about that actually that you guys might like. So you can look that up. Um, wow, imagine being a fungi traveling galaxies. I'm up for that. I know my friend, I know. Uh, read Mycelium Running, interesting book. Okay, thank you very much for the, uh, somebody please put that in the comments when you're watching this after the fact so that I can remember that. Uh, mycelium running. I will look that up. Um, thanks. I can't wait to get my shrooms. Yeah, buddy. Uh, okay. So really appreciate your help. Uh, let's see. DD have to go. I have visitors. Thank you though. Oh, DD. Yeah. My friends. Okay. I didn't even know you were here. You got to say what up earlier. Um, yes. Have a good day, my friends. I want to get back to what I think Jerry told us. Okay. Here we go. Okay, guys. So Jerry says one gallon molasses to 40 of water, um, 40 gallons that is. Yes. So one to 40. So Jerry says that for army worms to eliminate them, mix up a spray solution of molasses and water at one parts molasses to 40 parts of water, spray it on them. And that's going to in some way eliminate them. So do that. And then let me know your results but do it in a way that you can be very confident of the result that you tell me. Okay. This will be great because then we can tell other people. So, um, somebody, if you can write that in the comments, somebody that's watching this afterwards, pause this for a second and write it in the comments. What I just said, that recipe. Okay. Uh, so that we can all get that recipe and try it out because this is how we learn guys. You know, I mean, Jerry knows this from some way from his life experience and uh, we reach out to the community and then someone will know. And so we will then uh, utilize that, you know, and that's great. Um, let's see. Jacobine says, weed tea question, please. Can I add banana peels, urine and other fruit and veg scrap? Uh, yes, you can. We can. Can I add banana peels, urine and other fruit and veg scraps? Yes, you definitely can. You can add whatever you want in that. Now, the banana peels, are you growing bananas? Or do they come from, I mean, bananas are sprayed with a bunch of stuff, usually. Um, organic ones, not so much. I mean, they, they say not at all, but I have my doubts even of that um, because they still don't react the same as, you know, I lived in Thailand with banana trees and stuff and the bananas, they just react very different here, even the ones they claim to be organic. So I don't know about that so much. If you're growing bananas, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, now the urine, I, I, I would, cause it's such a rich source of nitrogen and minerals and mineral salts. I would make a separate one of the, the urine. I, I don't recommend mixing urine in with all the other fertilizers because right now, for example, uh, at late stage in the growth or in flowering, you're not going to want to add nitrogen. Okay. So that's the one that I would do. 
Um, Jacobine, I live in Thailand. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Then uh, that's cool. Are, are you are you a Far uh, what do they call him? Farang, Farang. Yeah, are you? Uh, <laughs> I lived in Thailand for a while. Um, are you an expat? Expat. That that's what Americans call being an immigrant or, or is expat. It's pretty funny. Uh, Ahmed Sa, army worm killing recipe. One part molasses to 40 parts water and spray on them worms. That's right, my friends. Thank you. Suffering with mild malaria in Thailand now, guys. Wish me luck. Oh, my friend. Yes, absolutely. Everybody let us send the healing energy to Jaka Bean in Thailand. May you be well, happy, and peaceful, my friend. Okay, let us uh, take a few more questions. This one's pretty fun, so pretty engaged with everyone. So let, unless they fall, three trees, oh uh, yes, okay. Now, did I, has anyone got any burning questions that I just, did I did not? What cover crops do you grow outside? Uh, yes, cover crops right now that I have growing because I'm in zone five slash six, I can use either the mammoth red clover or the crimson clover. I like the crimson clover more because I like how beautiful the um, flower is in the spring. Also, I think I like the name crimson and clover over and over. Uh, so a little bit dear to my heart, but mammoth red clover also is really great. Uh, so I'm growing crimson clover right now and um, uh, winter rye. So that's what I'm. That's what I've got right now, and it's popped up. And I'm remember I'm only doing those on the um, the beds that are going to be heat loving stuff next year, okay? The, there's other ways to do it, but this is my recommendation and philosophy. You only plant the cover crops, not in the things you're gonna try to plant early spring crops in, okay? Because we're not tilling here, so that's very different. So if you plant like winter rye or crimson clover and you think you're gonna plant um, onions in April or something, forget about it. Just forget about it. Um, so did you get the house plant fertilizer yet? Did you do the house plant? No, not yet, but that's right. Thank you for reminding me about that video house plant fertilizer video. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to line up the videos I'm going to have for the winter time. And I uh, need to write that one down. Cause I will forget about that. Um, house plant fertilizer, HPF. That'll remind me house plant fertilizer. So, um, my crimson clover is doing good. They say, odd of a four leaf in that variety is one in 10,000. Really? Have you, I've never in my whole life seen a, a four leaf clover and I've even looked in some places in all the world. I've never seen a four leaf clover. Um, are you a believer in nitrogen fixation in a raised bed by planting legume cover crops? Absolutely. 100% man. Uh, legumes, uh, including like the beans and peas, things grow really well after beans and peas and legumes, crimson clovers and stuff like that. They grow really well because of what it does to the soil. So yeah, oh, I'm a firm believer in that. And it's not even really a belief. It's just an absolute fact of the, uh, here I am talking about absolute facts, but just based on my experience, every time you plant, um, and you can do the experiments yourself. So have, have some ground and leave one, just add manure to one ground. Add a little bit of manure, but a legume to this ground and it will produce a soil or whatever you plant and then plant the same crop next after that. And the one that had the legume in it will grow much better than the other one. It uh, definitely happens that way. So Pam says, thank you, Nate, for another great sharing. Yes, we gotta bring this to an end, my friends. So if, uh, any more burning questions? How many days should I drink a cup of probiotics that you teach us to make? Thank you so much. Uh, the probiotics, are you talking about the Rejuvelac? Um, you can drink that. Do You want to cycle that. So, so make a batch and then drink it for a few days and then let it go and then drink and then make another batch and drink it for a few days. Yeah, the Rejuvelac, maybe I'll even make a video on this channel on how to make that. Uh, it is a delicious, really powerful rejuvenating tonic that we make from sprouted we ferment sprouted wheat in a special way, and you'll see in the video. Um, yeah, thank you for reminding me about that. Rejuvelac is super good, and it's good for this time of year, too. Um, Rainwater Refuge, are you overwintering anything? I'm going to try to overwinter my Carolina Reaper plant, and I'm nervous. Now, I don't overwinter anything like that because I don't have the space, but I know a lot of people do that. But just remember, it goes dormant, so it doesn't need 
fertilizer and all that stuff. Just let it go dormant. Let it go to sleep. And um, one love to everyone here right now. And thank you for your knowledge and time. Yes, Jacobine. Thank you very much, my friend. I hope you get better. And are you a believer? Okay, my friends. So uh, utilize the links in the description of the videos. If you want to get your grow tent set up, you know, you can do all that. But even if you're not into doing the grow tent setup, maybe you'll want to do it next year. That's fine. You can do the, the tub method that, that you see. So watch the last video I just made about three different options for making the humidity dome for your mushrooms because we're getting into mushroom growing season and we want to have the fruiting chambers right. And so uh, you can get all that stuff. Make sure that if you're using the links in the description, if there is a uh, discount code, try to use that because you get a discount and it helps the channel. And a big shout out to everyone that is using the links in the description to make a donation to the PayPal account is very much appreciated. And if you have to get a hold of me for something other than like a gardening question, then you can email me at gardenlikeviking at gmail. If it's like a consultation or something like that or, or pictures and stuff, go ahead and send me an email. Um, but if it's just a question, put them in the comments of the videos because that way everyone can benefit from what we're talking about. So, okay, my friends, uh, check out my other video, Nate M or my other channel, Nate Murray. If you're into more stuff like this about a much broader topics, and if you want to be entertained and see videos of my traveling, the saga of Nate Murray, both of those channels I link to at the bottom of my standard uh, channel page. Okay, so. Thanks for stopping by, my friends. It's been really fun. It's been like I've just been sitting in a room with a bunch of my friends. Uh, and so it's been cool. I'll see you guys next Saturday at 12 noon Eastern time.